Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hike and Draw. This is the nature drawing workshop. Like I said, it's a workshop that kind of encompasses everything we do in Hike and Draw. We got some botanical and landscape skills we're going to be working on. We also are going to be focusing on drawing nature objects. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how we approach nature drawing, and I'll even teach you uh, the system that I use to get started with these sorts of drawing projects. My name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide. And today I also have the pleasure and privilege of being your instructor. This is the breakout of today's agenda. And we're gonna be talking about goals. We're gonna be getting in the mood together and uh, also discussing the types of kit or uh, supplies that we'll need. Um, this entire workshop is supposed to be uh, a way for you to learn some skills here so that in the future you can go out hiking or go out into nature and take what you learn in class and apply it out in the real world. So um, that being said, what is the goal of nature drawing, right? It's more than just making pretty pictures in a sketchbook. The goal of nature drawing is to connect you with nature and there's no better way to hone in on the vibe, so to speak, of nature than by quietly sitting, looking, listening, and paying attention. The drawing part is just a tool to help you do those things, right? So you don't need to be a professional artist to do this. Anybody can do this. And it's a great way to not only learn things for yourself, but it's also a great um, visual and personal way to share what you've learned with other people. And it's one of those things, the more you do it, the more fun it becomes. It's a really great positive habit that just feeds into itself. And if this is your first ever nature drawing experience, I, I'm very excited for you. You're gonna have a really good time today. So it's a very inexpensive hobby. Whenever I consider the type of kit or supplies that I take with me on a hike, I know that there are three things that are always gonna come with me. And that is my nature journal, a pencil and a pen. That's it. That's all you need. Anything else that you want to bring with you, that's up to you. I always suggest if you are going out with a goal in mind, that's sort of how you modularize your kit. Uh, with those three base things, sketchbook, pencil, and pen, you could add things like color pencils or watercolors. Um, if you're more uh, into the science of nature, you can bring with small specimen containers and microscopes and all that other kind of stuff with you too. All that's extra, right? All you need for today is a piece of paper and a pencil. So I encourage people to find something that really excites them out there. You know, whether it's insects or birds or flowers or uh, landscapes, there's always something in nature that will appeal to you. Um, and that's part of the fun of it is every time you go out, you're not going to be uh, just stuck doing the same old thing. You're, you, you have all of nature to pick from. So it really helps to also consider how you can find little objects or artifacts in nature that you can bring home with you and practice with. I usually find leaves or feathers or shells on the ground. And these are things that I'll bring home and I'll study uh, more closely. And uh, I try my best to keep it at things that I find on the ground. I'm not really one for damaging or killing living organisms. Um, but there's something special about drawing a 3D object. We're gonna be working with photos today, but the skills that I'm gonna teach you next are things that you're gonna be able to do with three-dimensional objects. So we're going to go ahead and start our warm-up exercise. And I invite you to take out a piece of drawing paper and a pencil. And we're going to go over the hike and draw uh, technique, right? This is something that everybody can do. And uh, we're going to take all of that intimidation, just kind of throw it out the window for right now, because we're going to start with the simplest form of mark making. And if you've been to my classes before, you know exactly what we're going to start doing next. So I'm going to share my camera with you. I have uh, the face to face camera here, but I also have a top down camera where you'll be able to see the supplies. OK, and like I said, um, the, uh, I have a couple of pencils. Uh, this is a kneaded eraser. A kneaded eraser is very pliable and it's really nice for uh, being kind to the paper. It's not going to leave a, a, a pinkish mark. It's not going to rip up the paper. So if you're in the market for an eraser, 
this is the kind I use. I also have a pencil sharpener um, and a technical pencil. This is the kind I bring with me out into the field because I can always put the tip away and protect my pencil point from breaking while it's in my pack. Okay, so I'm going to take my regular piece of eight and a half by 11 paper and I'm just gonna fold it, fold it like this in half. All right, you might notice I have some binder holes punched into the side. That's because I'm, I'm very much, a, as, as much as I like to be an organized person. So I keep all of my nature drawings in a binder. All right, so to get started, what I'll invite you to do next is to simply draw a rectangle or a margin. Okay, just like this, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have totally straight lines, just straight enough. And the reason why I start my drawings this way is twofold. One, it gives me a clear area that I'm responsible for as the artist. And it gives me a nice place to add notes here and there, right? If you like to add notes on the margin, you can go ahead and write today's date, which is March the 13th. I'm very excited because in the Eastern United States, tomorrow is going to be the first day of daylight savings time. So we're gonna put the, we're gonna lose an hour of sleep, but we'll gain an hour of sunlight. Um, so I, I like to put the date up in the upper right hand corner. And we'll talk about little pieces of information as we move forward. So I'm gonna share my screen with you again. And this time we're gonna go ahead together and I'm going to show you this reference. Now, technically spring doesn't start for another week but the birds are already back. We're already seeing a lot of migratory species coming through here in New York. I took um, a walk yesterday and I started noticing the crocuses popping up. And then this morning I noticed that the crocuses were actually blooming. So that's interesting. My first uh, view of flowers was today. So that being said, we're gonna go ahead and assume, we're gonna fast forward a few weeks and we're gonna assume that um, we found on our imaginary hike together, a robin's nest. This is the American robin and we we know that it's a robin's egg because of that lovely sky blue color. Now there may not be something very exciting about drawing a couple of eggs together but what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you the step-by-step -step technique that you can apply towards more complicated drawing tasks. So I invite you to have this reference photo open and in case you missed it I sent it to you in the email, it's on the event page, and it's also in the chat, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to begin my drawing by sizing up what I have going on in this frame here. I'm gonna make it centered. So what I'm gonna do is very, very lightly just draw a vertical and horizontal line down the middle. And now you have a rectangle with four quadrants and this is approximately the middle of the page. Now, since we have two objects here, I'm going to, essentially, yes, a little bit. And I may make the eggs a little bit larger in my drawing than they are in real life. That's called zooming in. So I'm going to put a little mark here for the top of the egg. And I'm going to put a mark here for the bottom of the egg. And that's going to be my approximate height. And then my width, likewise, is going to be something like this. Okay, and it's an approximation, it's not an exact science. So we have these four dots in a diamond shape that's going to basically be the, um, the height and width of our first egg here. And the way in which we make this an egg is simply by using other dots just like this to create a outline, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is we are approaching this drawing differently. We're not going ahead and we're just jumping in with our line work. Instead, we're using this sort of dot technique, um, almost like you would if you were designing a blueprint, right? We're going to be plotting our coordinates here, kind of like an architect would. So that allows us to play around a little bit and actively edit our proportions. because. As you may have noticed, I went and I tried a couple of different pathways before I found a shape that resembles the robin's egg here. And that's a nice bit of flexibility that's built into this system because rather than treating it like a mistake, I'm more so treating it like a measurement, right? Now, having one sort of uh, planned out already, I'm gonna go ahead and plan my other egg. 
And I'm going to use the dimensions that I have here to gauge the dimensions of its little neighbor, which we're going to draw together in just a second. So these eggs are not quite touching, but they're very close to each other. So I can use this as one of my little guides. And you're going to notice that the eggs aren't perfectly parallel side by side. One of them is actually at kind of an angle like this. You don't have to draw this line. I'm just using it to demonstrate the angle. So since the eggs are approximate in shape and size, uh, approximately identical in shape and size, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two dots again. And this is going to be the height. And then I'm going to make two more dots to be the width. OK, so now that I have the height and the width figured for this egg, I'm going to do exactly what I did on the right hand side here. And I'm going to go ahead and use this dot technique to give myself an outline of the egg. OK, and technically, this is part of the, the planning phase. We're not really drawing right now. We're just planning out our drawings so that when we do get started with our line work, Everything is going to feel uh, accurate in terms of proportion. And that way we're gonna be having way more fun drawing our eggs than if we were to just jump into it because we're not gonna feel any kind of hesitation. Okay, so just like that. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. So we have these two little eggs sitting next to each other inside of the nest. And what we're going to do next is we're going to get rid of some of these little extra dots here that we don't need. For example, if you measured twice, that's fine. There's that old saying, measure twice, cut once. It's better to do more work planning than executing inaccurate work and having to do it all over again, okay? So I'm just gonna get rid of some of the extra marks here, okay? And I can get rid of some of my guidelines too. Okay, now I'm ready to start drawing. So what I'm going to do next is I'm not going to connect the dots literally because again, I'm, I'm a big fan of thinking like an architect. I wanna actively edit. So that means if, for example, I find that the proportion isn't as accurate as I see, I can go ahead and edit actively and change the, um, either the shape of the egg or the, the angle something like that. I'm not basically required to connect the dots literally. They're just there as kind of a guideline. And also, if it helps, you can also uh, tilt your paper. I find that it's very useful to be able to move your paper around. And that's kind of why, you know, for example, if you're a lefty, you can avoid doing um, any, any smudging by mistake. Another thing you can do is take a little piece of scrap paper and put it on top of the pencil work you already did. And that way you can rest your hand on that and avoid smudging the, the uh, pencil already, um, just like you did, okay? So I'm just going to move along just like that, nice and easy, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing on the other side, except I wanted to uh, bring this up. The eggs are not as close in this little sketch as they are in the picture. So this is a perfect example of actively editing. If I wanted to, let's say, make this egg a little bit wider so that it was touching, all I have to do is consider the, the, um, the angle, right? Just like this. And I'll come in there with dots, just like I did before, and correct or make a more accurate measurement just like this. So in theory, I'd be following this group of dots rather than these groups of dots, and that's fine. All right, so I can go ahead up here and I can extend this a little bit so that it's more in proportion to what's um, actually in the photograph, just like this, okay? And that is what I mean by actively editing, okay? Very, it takes away the intimidation factor when you look at it like a measurement rather than a mistake. So what I like to do next is I'll just go in here before I continue and get rid of the excess dots that I don't need anymore. And that way, I'm going to be able to uh, essentially work a little bit neater, okay? And that, that helps us to construct this drawing a little bit more 
uh, efficiently too. And again, you could move the paper around as you see, uh, as, as your comfort needs. Okay, just like this. I'm not pressing down hard on the paper. I'm just letting myself barely let the pencil press the paper and I'm getting a nice light line, not too dark. Okay, now, now that we have this sort of line work down, what we can do next, if, 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 if it's bothering you, what we can do next is kind of get rid of these excess dots again, just like that. And that way, if, if you're a perfectionist, you're not gonna be bothered by the remaining dots. Sometimes people like the way they look. It helps to show process. But if you're more for realism and you want to just make sure you're only drawing the egg, you can go ahead and get in there with your eraser and just maybe even go over your line very lightly. Just like that, so you can still see the line, but you can't see the dots. And that way you can come in here with your pencil and have a dot free sketch. Okay, same thing over here. So now that we have this part done, let's talk about line weight, okay? So line weight refers to the darkness or thickness of a line. And we can use this to our advantage, okay? Because there's a light source, okay? And that light source is coming from, uh, I would say, based on the reflection in the photograph, the light source is coming from like this direction here. So we're gonna see some highlights on the egg. You don't have to draw these highlights. I'm just using this as a, as a talking point here. And you're also going to see some shadow happening here. Now don't draw these. Don't draw what I'm drawing right now. I'm just, just explaining to you. So line weight, thickness or darkness of line. How are we going to communicate that the light is coming from this direction by just doing line work and not shading, okay? The answer is very simple. All we do is we look to see where a shadow is. For example, on this left egg over here, I see that there is a shadow right there. So I can take my pencil and I can go ahead and press a little bit harder here where I can thicken the line a little bit, just like this. And what it's going to do is imply shadow without even shading. Okay, this is a nice little trick because if you don't have all the time in the world, let's say we're actually on a hike together and you wanna do a little sketch of these bird's eggs, okay? You may not have all the time to shadow and add all of the different uh, you know, layers of light value or blend or anything like that. So just simply making this line darker, you're going to infer that there's a shadow there. Conversely, if you have a little uh, kneaded eraser like I do, you can just push down like that on top of the pencil and it'll pull up the excess material and that'll make this line lighter, okay? So in terms of line weight, we have variation now because there's two different line weights. There's heavy and dark and then there's uh, light and well, light. <laughs> so. If we were to do the same thing on this side, where would you estimate the shadow to be, right? It would be in the space between the two eggs. Okay, so I'll go in here with a little bit of extra thickness, just like that. And I'll also use this as an opportunity to actively edit and just round off this side of the egg, just like that, okay? So we have a little bit of shadow happening there. We also have some on this side as well, because it isn't a nest after all, and it's being held in um, sort of a cup, like, like this eraser is being held in the cup of my hands. That's sort of how these eggs are being cradled within the nest. And there's a little bit of shadow on the top right over here, okay? So now that we have these eggs, what we can do is consider also the type of uh, pattern that we're seeing in the grass here. And we don't literally have to draw every single uh, blade of grass, but what I would like to do is just 
pay attention to the direction in which the grass is being uh, folded into itself. And I'm going to very lightly with my pencil, just take note of the different directions in which the grass is being uh, bent into a nest. And I'm only going to do it, I'm not gonna draw the whole nest. I'm only going to do it to um, encircle the eggs here and to make this drawing more than just two egg shapes on a piece of blank paper. You know, I'm just very, very light and carefree, not holding any sort of judgment here. I'm just getting myself oriented with the shape of the nest. And it's kind of interesting when you look at a bird's nest, you get to see the remarkable ingenuity that comes with a limited tool set. Right. So since this is just a warm up, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. But there's another way for you to add more informational value to this sketch, even though it's just a warm up, even though we're doing something nice and light and loose to get started. Let's talk a little bit about adding notes. Okay. So if you think about this, like we're on a hike together and we're finding uh, all these different artifacts to take home or to take pictures of or, or take notes of, um, it's kind of hard to carry everything back home with you. So we do uh, field sketches in order to not only collect um, single instances that we find like this bird's nest, but then there are things, there are data points that we can recollect that tie our entire day together, our entire hike together. Right, so obviously the date is a is a great way. It's a time stamp. Okay, so we know that we found this bird's nest on this date. Now, um, if we had a location, right? Let's say that we were hiking together, and uh, the name of the location um, you can just pull any old name out of there. Let's say we were hiking in. Um, I'll, I'll pick a park out here in uh, in New York. Let's say we were hiking in Prospect Park. Okay, now we have a location. So that's two data points. That's a, a, a place and a time, okay? So I wouldn't reckon, I, I don't think the, the birds are laying eggs this early, but maybe fast forward to you know another couple of weeks, you might be finding these types of things. But um, the important thing about the date is you'll be able to gauge when the birds are gonna be doing this activity and not only when, but uh, also what. Or, or who, what kind of birds are here and, and doing this type of activity, right? So we had mentioned earlier that we had found, um, that we had identified these as robin's eggs. So how do we tell that to the, uh, the person looking at our sketch if um, we aren't coloring in our eggs blue? We could indicate with a note, right? So let's say, for example, I'll draw a little indicator here and I'll say light blue. And this is an American robin. I know over in Europe, the robins are a little bit different. They have a, a more of an orange color, a different shape. So I'm gonna put uh, American robin to avoid confusion. Okay, light blue American robin eggs. Another thing you can do is if you feel the need, you can carry a little tape measure or um, I know that they also make little bracelets with measurement increments on them. Um, you can take a little measurement here, right? You can add a dimension, another data point. So for example, if I wanted to measure the egg and accurately give the viewer an idea of the size of this egg, we, should, we can go ahead and say, okay, this is approximately, and, and I know we have folks over here from Europe, uh, so, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the metric system, even though I may not be as accurate. Um, let's say, for example, it's a uh, six centimeter length and a four centimeter width. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so now we're getting even more information. We're looking at the size of the eggs. And if we do this to a few bird's nests, 
we can gauge which eggs may, might be abnormally large or kind of small, which might also indicate the health of the bird that laid the egg. So now we have an additional data point. We have our date, we have our location, we have some notes describing color, we have measurements. This is a great amount of information here. Another fun thing is there might be other things within this nest. I know if you zoom in on the reference photo kind of around here, you'll see a tiny little uh, insect. Okay, it looks like uh, what we call in the United States roly-poly bugs. Uh, basically, these are a type of uh, bug that you'd find under a rock or someplace that is moist. And, and when you go to pick them up, they curl up into a little ball. And if you were like me, you'd have a whole lot of fun with them, watching them roll up in your hand uh, when you're a little kid. So you can go ahead and write down what else you're finding in the nest as well. This is definitely not the scientific name. <laughs> sometimes you find feathers, sometimes you find egg fragments, which could be an indication of a nest invasion, or it could be an indication that the, the birds hatched. But just with this warm up, what we've done, a wood louse, thank you. Um, there we go, I have to remember that for next time. So just with the baseline skills that we have here, you can imagine going on a hike with a little uh, sketchbook or a nature journal and filling out a ton of information just by sitting and drawing uh, these types of nature objects that you're finding. And while you're looking at them, you might notice things that you wouldn't normally notice otherwise. Okay, so that is our warm up exercise. Let's go ahead and proceed with the uh, lesson packet here. Okay, so I'm just checking the chat. There we go. <laughs> yeah, insects aren't for everybody. That's okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply some of the basic drawing principles that we did in our warm up exercise to an even bigger picture, right? If this was, if, if our warm up was a micro view, let's do a macro view. Let's zoom out, okay? And this is going to be uh, our landscape exercise. We usually have a uh, landscape drawing workshop once a month. This month's is happening on Thursday next week. We're gonna be recording that as well. So if you can't make the live workshop, you can always um, pick up uh, a ticket for the recording in the lesson packet. Uh, but for this, it's super simple. All you need is a pencil and a piece of paper, right? And we're going to uh, use the little rectangle that we draw around the page and we'll be able to uh, use that as sort of our tool for setting up our drawing, okay? So here is our reference photo. I wanted to get a lovely spring photograph and we have a, a beautiful bog here. Um, in spring, I love going to swamps and bogs because the, the mosquitoes aren't out in force yet. And you're also going to see a, a whole lot of wildlife from reptiles and fish to different types of interesting birds. I don't necessarily mind going to swamps and wet places in the summer. It's just more of a hassle because you got to deal with the mosquitoes. Anyway, here is a beautiful landscape. And we also see some mountains out in the background. There's still snow on them. We have some clouds, some weather front moving in. So it might be raining soon. And um, there's so much to see here. So how do, we, how do we begin this? Well, this is the reference photo that I sent you. This is reference photo number two. So I invite you to keep this open while I switch over to the top-down camera. First thing I'm gonna do um, is just essentially flip this over and I'm just gonna use the same piece of paper here. Gonna be mindful of my resource use. And I'm going to create another rectangle. So. As I mentioned again, you know, in the beginning, I say that I use a rectangle to establish the space that I'm gonna be working in as the artist, right? Then it's also a nice place to add some additional notes. And thirdly, it's a nice way to measure and uh, make sure that your proportions are accurate. Okay, with a landscape. All right, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is good enough, okay? so. Now that I've squared off my page, let's go ahead. We're going to look at the reference photo together and we're going to dive right in here and talk about how to begin planning a landscape drawing. Okay, so here's the reference photo again. Now, 
because we're working in a frame, right? We're taking this big, beautiful view. I know that photos never do anything justice. Same thing, you know, unfortunately, you know, we can't take everything that we see and pack it into a, a little rectangular space, but we can do our best. And the nice thing about packing all this stuff into a rectangular space is that things run into the sides of your rectangle. That's where we're going to start. Okay. So if we look at the right hand, upper right hand corner here, we're going to see some sky and some clouds, and we're going to work our way down vertically until we hit this, um, this area here, which I like to call the horizon line. This is where, or a, a ridge line more accurately. Okay. This is where the mountain ridge um, pierces into the sky. Okay. So I'm going to make a little mark right here. Okay. I don't know how many centimeters are in an inch. <laughs> I should know this by now. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess this is about an inch or so from the top. Okay. Maybe uh, eight centimeters from the top, hopefully maybe six centimeters from the top. Okay. And all I'm going to do is make a little reference mark, a tick mark, so to speak. And then I'm going to continue down until I hit this brush area here. So that brush area is going to be the second tick mark that I make. Okay, so 2.5 centimeters, not six to eight centimeters, my bad. Thank you for putting that in the chat. <laughs> so this area here, okay, is gonna be um, recognized by another little tick mark. Okay, not so big as the first one. Okay, so I'm gonna make a little tick mark there. And now you're gonna see where this tree line meets with the ground. Okay, so you're gonna have another one very soon, another tick mark right there. And that's approximately where that grass is gonna start. Okay, and as you make your way down, 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 the train doesn't really change too much. So we're done with this side. So now let's go take a visit over to the opposite side. Now that we're on the ground, let's start in the bottom left-hand corner. From here to here, we're still seeing this, this um, kind of tussock, okay? so. When we hit the water here, I'm just gonna make another little reference mark with my pencil. And that is going to be a, another little reference point. And so is this, because that's the, um, essentially the body of water before it reaches the grass again. Okay, so everywhere where there's a natural border or edge, that's where we wanna pay attention to, attention to. Here is the grass running into the tree line again. So that warrants yet another tick mark. And if you look directly across the page, that's kind of parallel where we drew our um, last tick mark indicating the break between the tree line and the grass. Okay, now we have the mountain right around there, which is also kind of parallel with where the other mountain was, maybe just a little bit lower. Okay, and then we have some clouds. All right, which we can either draw in or leave out. So I'm gonna share my screen with you really quick to kind of give you an indication of what this looks like, okay? And basically everywhere I'm seeing a natural border in the landscape on either side, I'm using this margin as a measuring tool, okay? This measuring tool comes in handy when you're trying to work really quick on landscapes, but also when you're trying to um, divide the landscape into different layers. Okay, so here's what I have. I'm all set up. I'm ready to start my next phase, which is, you guessed it, dots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the most clear and um, straightforward um, feature to concentrate on first, which can be for us that little area, that little bog area. So I'm gonna just come in here with my dots. It doesn't have to be super tight. It doesn't have to be something that is accurate. Just enough, it just has to be accurate enough so that it's in proportion with the rest of the landscape. Notice how this, um, this is the area here um, where the water, uh, the first body of water, we're looking at um, a little bog. So we have that body of water that we're putting into the landscape, we're building into the landscape together. And the water ends around here, but if you look closely, you'll see a little indentation in the grass, which makes it run almost to the edge of this area. Now, fun fact about this stuff, once the snow and ice melts, 
this landscape gets saturated. So even if you're not walking in a puddle, you can be standing here in the grass and your boots will get soaking wet because almost like a sponge, it just soaks up that landscape. Our folks in Scotland can definitely recognize that type of terrain, okay? That's, that's uh, also one of the ways in which peat is formed. And um, thank God for that, because otherwise we wouldn't have single malt scotch. Okay, so now that we have a little indicator here for our bog, we're gonna move up and we're gonna make sure that we um, get that area where the tree line meets the grass, okay? So that's going to be where we draw in the grass. And then the tree line itself, we're going to, we're going to treat this a little bit differently. It's not going to be as cut and dry as the, uh, as the other features. We'll get back to this tree line in just a second. But for now, what I want to do is get that mountain, um, that ridge line, okay? And that's going to be up here, okay? And that ridge line is going to be intercepted by a cloud, okay? So it's always important to pay attention to the sky throughout the day because that's going to give you an indication of the kind of weather that you're going to encounter. Sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but you'd be surprised how many people go out on the trail without checking the weather. That's part of being prepared. So for anybody else, else who's planning on doing some hike, hiking, um, especially in areas where you know the weather to be a little bit aggressive, <laughs> you know, it's always good to plan uh, for a little bit of uh, a rain shower. Uh, so anyway, here's what I'm doing. Since that cloud's intercepting the landscape, what I'm doing is I'm getting these mountain peaks in. I'm planning these mountain peaks to be approximately here, okay? And we can always actively edit and change our minds later, but the clouds and the mountain peaks and the, you know, this whole ridge line sort of blends into a single entity. So that's why I'm treating it that way. Okay, and we have these, these gentle rolling foothills, okay, at the base of these mountains, and that's kind of get, giving us an additional layer to work with here. So by doing all of this planning first, we're setting ourselves up for success when the time comes to actually draw the place. Okay, and we're using this method very matter-of-factly because a, the, the dot is the simplest form of mark making that we can invent. That's, that's the, uh, the reason why we go with dots first. There's no excuses. Everybody can draw a dot. And also, oh, you know what? This is pretty cool. There's like a little lake all the way back here. I didn't notice that before. Okay. I'm just going to use dots to indicate that as well. Um, so yes, train of thought. Everybody can draw a dot. And by using this type of system, we're creating a, a, a kind of blueprint to draw on top of. Now, we don't have to connect these dots verbatim. They're just there to help guide us. We're going to be using a bunch of different types of line because we have a bunch of different types of terrain features. For example, the mountains in the background are going to look a little bit different uh, than the, uh, the clouds that are intercepting them. The mountains are, are sharp and rugged, whereas the clouds are soft and cushiony, right? Uh, the trees, they all have different characters of their own. Usually the further north you go, the taller and thinner the trees are, okay? It has to do with sunlight. It also has to do with the type of wind. Um, if you're familiar with the very northerly and windy locations, you'll start seeing more spruce trees um, that are thin and narrow, and sometimes they're even missing branches on the sides of uh, where, where the prevailing wind blows, but we'll get into that in a minute. <clears throat> so now that we have this sort of template in place, what we're going to do next is we're going to find um, a nice way to inject some more characters into this story. So I'm talking about the trees. So I'm gonna look and see, based on this little guideline here, this is where the, the grass and the tree line meets, how far from the edge of this margin our first tree is going to be. I'd say right around here. Okay, so I'll use another little mark to indicate that, maybe uh, two and a half centimeters. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to note the height of the tree. So based on the proportions that I'm seeing here, 
the height of the tree should go no taller than this dot here. Now the width of the tree, okay, we have a little bit of space from the end of the margin. So that should be like from here to here. Okay, so just like our bird's eggs earlier, what we're doing is we're planning our proportions first so that when we start our drawing, it's going to fit with the rest of the proportions surrounding it. Okay, and a fun way to draw trees isn't to just get a little trunk and make a little stick figure. In fact, I like starting at the top of the tree and it allows us to create a more convincing illusion here. Okay, and that is uh, essentially that a tree isn't like a pipe cleaner. It's not all symmetrical. There's going to be some randomness. There's going to be a, um, a nice bit of ver variety in its structure. So that's what I like to call the tree's character. So how do we get a character uh, out of a tree? So all I'm doing is I'm looking and I'm using sort of my, I'm not looking at it as a literal thing right now. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the basic gesture of the tree and we'll talk more about gesture in a little bit. And I'm gonna use dots and lines and dashes to give myself the, the strong personality of this tree here. You're gonna note that in the Northern hemisphere, typically trees grow more branches on the Southern side because when the, when the sun is at its zenith in the nor Northern hemisphere, it's not at exactly above where the tree is, there's that arc that happens because of the curvature of the planet and so on. So that happens to be on the Southern side of the tree. So trees are very much like us in the fact that they're opportunists. So if you had an opportunity to maximize on a resource, you double down on what generates the resource. In this instance, it's photosynthesis and trees perform photosynthesis through their foliage. So that would mean that they would double down on the amount of trees on the areas where there is the most sun. Now also wind is a big factor in how tree branches grow. And if you're interested in more about this kind of stuff about trees, I'm running a workshop on Thursday night, seven o'clock Eastern time. And uh, we're gonna be recording that as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how, the types of trees that we put in our landscapes. So look very closely. All I have here, okay, is, is a lot of dots and some dashes, and that's giving me the kind of character I want for the tree. I haven't laid down any solid line work yet. I'm definitely going to. But for now, we're going to just stick with what we have right here and then move on to another character, which happens to be right here. We have another tree. It pops up its head right around there. So this is the tallest this tree is going to be. It's about this far apart, maybe an inch and a quarter apart from this tree here. And the ground, I haven't drawn where the tree meets the ground yet because we have to put some vegetation there, okay? So the width is gonna be a little bit broader on this tree because this one over here, this is probably a birch. It's probably a birch tree. It's gonna have a nice canopy, very wide spreading tree. These are what we call pioneering trees. So that means that they usually like to be on the edges of forests or uh, standing alone in a field. They like wet soils, okay, and that, that allows them to thrive. And all I'm doing is I'm grabbing that profile here and I'm injecting it into the drawing very, very loosely, again, using the dots. And that's to get, again, that character. All right, and don't forget, you know, if, if for example, you gotta head out or anything like that, if, or if, you're, if, if this is too fast for you, we're recording this workshop, so you can always take a look at it later. I'll be sending that in an email at the conclusion of the workshop. Okay, so I'm not too much concerned with the branches and the uh, trunk. <laughs> and it's okay if you're not getting this right away, that's fine. This is, a, this is something that, um, it takes a little bit of practice, but don't, don't fear, it's okay. What we're gonna do next is, um, a little bit more up your alley, I think, if you're having trouble with this. It's actually designed to be a little bit more forgiving, uh, so to speak. So um, now that we have this tree in here, okay, just the profile, just to get that vague character in, we can kind of figure out how the rest of this is gonna play out. And um, usually when it comes to doing these sort of uh, borders, these terrain borders, you know, I'm looking at the smaller trees, I'm looking for things that create a silhouette, right? And since we have that, that um, 
I guess that's a lake or it's a very low hanging cloud. Let's call it a lake. Because we have that lake behind the tree line, you can see that in the reference photo, we have some great silhouettes here, which is gonna help us to create a convincing tree line. Okay, same thing here, All right? We have what looks like a, a fir tree. That's the quintessential Christmas tree. Standing next to uh, another one. Okay, so I get the height, I get the width. And I just use my dots and dashes to create a profile here. And slowly but surely, we're building up from that initial, from those initial measurements that we did around the page. Okay. We're also going to notice there's another taller tree right around here. Okay. So I get the height, I get the width, and I go ahead and I very, very loosely, nice and easy, get that outline. And yeah, we're drawing on top of the dots that we already made for the uh, landscape, but that's fine. Don't let that slow you down. Okay, and there happens to be another tree in front of it. So we won't be too concerned with filling in a trunk. We're gonna leave that unfinished for now. And we're just gonna walk our way over and, oh, there's another little fir tree. Okay, and we have some more naked branches. These ones are probably still budding. That, that has to do with that nice reddish color that you're seeing there. I know that back here in New York, the silver maples are starting to flower and uh, produce what they call catkins. Those are those little hanging flowers. You usually see those with trees that pollinate via the wind. They don't require pollinators like butterflies or bumblebees to help them out that way. They simply re rely on the wind. Okay. And yeah, we have some more trees here, very, very thin. And then we run into the side of the page. So now we have a very simple and um, you know, nice quaint silhouette of the type of trees and, and foliage that are growing here. And what we can do to help reinforce this is just to get back in where there's little blank spaces and kind of fill those out. For example, we have these nice skinny and uh, bald trees here, kind of just hug the tall tree that's growing above it. All right, we also have some more of that in front of this tree. So I'm gonna show you a little closer here. What I'm doing is I'm kind of implying tall grass and I'm not using a solid line to do that. I'm using a lot of different marks. A lot of energy are in these marks. Okay, you're also gonna notice a lot of white space. That helps to create that airy kind of feel. For example, when we get into the mountains, we're not gonna be having nice light and airy lines. When we do this tree, for example, if I am to um, solidify this tree here, all I'm doing is following the dots that I drew earlier. I'm not tracing them verbatim, I'm just using them as guidelines. Okay, we have some more rogue branches coming out like that, but the solidness of the line is what's going to cause that nice contrast to the light airy lines that are uh, in the surrounding landscape. Okay, so I'm just, I'm not tr I'm trying to draw every single branch on the tree. I'm just trying to get the character, just trying to understand what this tree is up to, maybe where the, the wind, what direction the wind is blowing, what kind of sun exposure this tree gets. Those are the kinds of questions I think when I draw a landscape. Okay, we have some branches going this way and that. Okay, done. That's all the work I need to do on that tree. Don't want to overdo it. So when I come down here on the where the grass meets the tree line, see how these lines are very, very energetic and they're not solid that's gonna help us create the illusion of grass. So now we have this tree, tr this uh, birch tree here, and you're gonna notice that the tree trunk will split in a number of different directions, usually three or four. Okay, just like that. And I don't wanna to get too involved with drawing all the sticks and twigs. So I'll go in here with my pencil and I'll just fill in using random marks, just like this. Same kind of concept with the grass. You create a solid structure and then you contrast that solid structure with something that is light and airy. In this case, 
that's going to be all the foliage and the, and the branches that umbrella out from the trunk of this tree here. Okay. And we don't want to overwork it. We just want to get it to feel nice and light and airy. Okay. And we can connect with the rest of the tree line by just continuing that mark making pattern. Okay. So this is how you tackle a more detailed landscape. It's by dividing and conquering, right? You don't want to just take one big chunk out at a time. You know, that's how you choke. What you want to do is you want to approach it with that kind of architect mindset and build it step by step. And the goal is to make you sit in a place long enough to learn something from the, from the, from the environment around you. It could be different bird songs that you hear. Because tell you the truth, when you walk into a, a landscape, right? When you're walking through the woods or you decide to take a break and you sit next to a lake, you might notice, well, there isn't much happening around here. Well, that's because the animals are also watching you just like you like to watch them. They're checking you out, making sure that you're safe. And then once you're there for about five, 10 minutes, the brave ones come out first, then the shy ones eventually come out. And that way, even though you're sitting here working on a landscape, you have all of this action unfolding around you. It's giving you something to do. You know, we, we like to have instant gratification. And unfortunately, well, maybe not so unfortunately, but nonetheless, that's not how nature works. Okay, we come to it, it doesn't come to us. So the majority of the work is actually gonna be here in this tree line. So if you're feeling like, okay, this is getting to be a little bit too tedious for me, don't worry. What we're gonna do next is we're going to fill in those mountains behind the tree line. And that's gonna give us that nice solid anchor, those solid lines that we need in order to create the proper amount of contrast to make this landscape feel more balanced. Okay, same thing, check out this tree here. Right? I'm not going to go ahead and draw a solid tree trunk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a couple of these key branches that come out like that. And then I'm just going to fill in the rest, dashes and dots, just like that. OK, and this is going to help us to make a nice contrast with those mountains in the background. OK, same thing here. We have these skinny trees without any foliage. I'm just going to dance with my pencil across this space right here. I'm also gonna to remember to use those lines filled with energy and using a lot of little dashes and dots to create some white space to make a nice soft border with the grassland just like that. Okay. There you go. And this is a little bit darker than the grass, so we can go in and fill in that with uh, other marks too. Oh, that's a nice quote. Nature talks to those who listen. Nice. I always think about Thoreau or Muir whenever I hear quotes like that. It's true. That's part of the idea of, of doing the drawing is that you're, you're engaging your mind, you're, you're giving yourself that stimulus, but you're also shutting everything that is distracting out so that you're kind of hyper-focused simultaneously. And that puts you in a really great position to notice you're kind of engaging your primitive mind, your, your, uh, your lizard brain, so to speak. And that's gonna allow you to pick up on subtleties faster than if you were just hiking through a landscape, pausing for a few seconds to take a picture and then moving on. That's the difference. You know, it's not about drawing versus photography. I mean, I've, I've sat up with friends in the middle of the night taking night sky photos for hours, you know, but it's more about injecting yourself into that environment and truly being present there. Okay, so I made this darker without shading. Really, all I'm doing is I'm adding on layers and layers of these little light marks. And again, that was the hardest part of this landscape. The hardest part, okay? Now we're gonna do the easy stuff. 
let's talk about these mountains, okay? Now there's a cloud obscuring these mountains, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on drawing uh, just the peaks that we can see. Okay, and I'm gonna use this tree as sort of like a measurement gauge. How far away is this tree from this mountaintop, right? I'm actually noticing that I made that mountaintop a little bit too low. So going back to that idea of actively editing, I'm gonna go ahead and make it up here instead. Okay, because the rest is gonna be obscured by a cloud anyway. Okay, and I'm gonna come over here with my pencil and I'm gonna use a solid line Get those sharp angles in there. Just like that. And if you want to erase some of those dots that are in there to kind of tidy up your workspace, feel free to move your page around to do that. <clears throat> there we go. comes a certain point where you're not so reliant on the dots. They're, they're definitely always going to be there to help you out. But the more practice you get with this, the more time you spend drawing from life or even using photos, but life is drawing from life is a little bit more fun, I think. Um, you're going to be able to pick up on doing the line work way faster. Maybe you'll only need a few key um, indicators, right, without having to rely too heav heavily on all of the dots, but it'll be a nice way to um, get you past that beginner stage. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of um, play here with the clouds, but before we do that, I also wanna solidify the ground uh, on the ridge line behind the trees here. And that's gonna help, really help to give us a, a nice um, stern contrast. Now, the line I'm gonna be using is connected but I'm gonna be moving my pencil up and down very subtly, almost like a Richter scale, like I'm measuring an earthquake. And that's gonna help us give the illusion of trees on the, on the landscape in the background, see that? Okay, it's not just a solid line like these rocky peaks. Those are very solid and angular and geometric because they're rock. But when there's trees to consider, what I do is very, very subtly, I just move my pencil up and down, up and down, kind of like um, either a heart rate monitor or a, a Richter scale would, or a lie detector test would. Okay, and that's giving us a nice, subtle reminder that these are not just bald hilltops, but there are in fact trees growing out in the distance as well. Okay, and these types of textures are great to apply to other types of drawings as well. For example, we do classes where we draw birds, we do classes where we draw animals with fur, um, reptiles with, uh, with scales. You know, there's, there's all these little subtleties that you can use with a pencil that really help to um, make, make things feel super realistic in a very simple way. Okay, we have a couple of layers of these foothills here before we reach the clouds, so. Just making note of that. And this is also a nice way, for example, to, to hide the dots so you don't have to erase them because they just blend right in with this type of background work. Okay, just like that. That one went rogue, okay. Great, and, you, and look at how these things interact with each other. Look at these layers and these mountains here, it's beautiful. I'm always someone to stop and look at the view, <laughs> even if I'm in a rush. Okay, so we have a lake here as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sketch that in and I'm going to make the border of the lake very light. Okay, and right where the, the land meets the lake, I'm going to do the tree trick again, because that adds more than just a banal border. It gives it some character. We also have that little pocket in there that's a little lake as well, or a lock, as you'd say in Scotland, right?
have to make my way out there once all this pandemic business is over. Okay. And you just dabble in that landscape. I always wonder what it would be like to be drawing a landscape and in real time, the landscape changes. <laughs> like if there, there was a meteor impact or a tree falls down, <laughs> something, I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting because if you look at some of the drawings, especially drawings of glaciers from the early 1900s and 1800s, you do see the landscape change dramatically, especially if you have a side-by-side -side comparison. So there is a value, a, a historic value to photographing and drawing landscapes that go just beyond making a, a nice little um, sketch or meditation exercise. You know, it's, it's kind of important that we document things, you know? Change is a part of nature. You know, it's part of that, it's that, it's that uh, chaotic archetype. You know, with the chaos comes the order. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the for these sort of foothills over here. We got some shadow happening. So in areas that you want to fill in with shadow, you can just very quickly like that. Don't have to go too crazy. Just enough to give a little bit of a variation in value. When we talk about contrast, we're talking about the relationship between um, not only values, but also color. Value is the contrast between light and dark, specifically. So that's an art term that you might hear from time to time, value. Nice little sketch like that. Okay, same thing. If you also notice in the distance, you're going to see that the sky becomes lighter as it meets the horizon. Okay, and that's a very natural effect. You're gonna see a blue sky. If you look straight up, you'll see a bright blue sky. And then all of a sudden, as you move your eyes towards the horizon, you're gonna see it fade to a lightish color. And I have these clouds coming in here, nice and fluffy clouds. Okay, and they get a little bit darker. So that means probably some weather's coming. Time to head home. Okay, and here's the nice blanket of clouds right here, touching those mountain peaks. Okay, forget what these types of clouds are called. Cumulonimbus are the big ones, right? I think so. Okay, now that we did all of this background stuff, we, we still have the foreground and I know we're running out of time for class. So I'm just going to breeze through this really quick. You don't have to try to keep up with me. I'm just going to make it so that I don't leave you hanging here. So um, with this grass business in the foreground, we're going to take a look at this, at this little body of water here um, because we got some nice reflection happening there, but I want to give you a kind of a way to sketch grass. Okay. And I'm doing it very randomly but I also want to pay attention to the way in which the direction in which the grass is bending as a whole, okay? Because that could indicate a prevailing wind. It could indicate that it might've just snowed recently and that that all melted off and that everything's coming up from the snow. Uh, typically it has to do with sunlight and wind. So I could picture this being a very gusty place, especially in the winter. Okay, and I'm just coming in here and using marks, random marks, but paying attention to the general direction in which the grass is bending as well. That's a unifying factor in, in a lot of different types of landscapes. Um, okay, there's also some reflections happening too. So for the reflections, I'm just gonna use dots, just like that. Okay, and it's gonna be a little bit darker as well. So I'll get in there with my pencil and I usually stick with a single direction with when it comes to reflections, because it also helps to unify with mark making. Okay. Here's the rest of the border here. 
more reflections, quick marks, making sure we're paying attention to the way in which the grass all bends together. That helps to unify the piece. It also tells us some interesting information about the landscape. I can't help get over the fact that there are oil paintings that were done over a hundred years ago, 150 years ago. Um, especially in New York, we have this group of painters called the Hudson Painters. And one of them, uh, Edwin Church, was famous for tracing the steps of Alexander von Humboldt. And a lot of these early explorers and adventurers would, because we didn't, they didn't have cameras, would sketch or write detailed accounts of their landscapes and their environments, right? So that's a skill that you pick up just being out in nature and paying close attention to this kind of stuff. Now, the, the oil paintings that Edwin Church produced were all based on the writings and of Alexander von Humboldt, but Church actually went down to South America where von Humboldt was exploring in the early 1800s. And painted in great, great detail, these amazing South American landscapes. And it's, um, it's really cool because if you're, if you're very in tune with nature and you understand uh, some of the ways in which um, the way the trees bend or the, or the way the trees grow, um, the way the light hits the horizon, you can tell the time of year, you can tell approximations of um, what the latitude is, you can, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. But anyway, I tell you that long story to say that because of these paintings, like experts were able to determine the time of year <laughs> and uh, the time of day. And when you combine that with the writings, you get a very, very interesting and accurate account of um, something that has nothing to do with digital technology or computers. It's all done by just noticing different parts of the landscape and being able to render um, accurately with paint. So, all right, we're just gonna work our way a little bit faster than usual here because we only got 15 minutes left. I can't believe how fast time flies, but notice how even though I'm seemingly doing this randomly, the one thing I'm really focused on is the fact that the grass all kind of shares a, a direction and it's moving this way from right to left. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure that as I'm making my grass, it kind of bends that way. And you're gonna be able to make your landscape feel more intentional by following the behavior, not by drawing everything exactly perfect, but just understanding the way in which the land is behaving and accurately portraying that. So the grass is bending this way. If you do the entire field following that uh, leftward direction, you're going to have a, a better landscape than if you were to not pay attention to that, so to speak. Just feels more alive that way. And that's something, again, you pick up when you hike, when you're out there. I mean, I'm all for drawing with reference photos. I mean, professionally, I, I need to do that. Um, but nothing really compares with being out there and actually drawing in, in the environment you're trying to portray. It's so cool. Oh, I also noticed that you can see the mountain peaks reflected in this little lake here. That's kind of cool. I'm going to get that. Okay, we're also noticing that there's shadows from this direction. So that means the sun's either coming up or going down based on where this picture was taken. And you don't always have to draw things that are exclusively in the landscape. Like for example, if you want to add a bird or something, yeah, you're totally free to do that. Let's say for example, when you sat here to start doing your landscape, a flock of geese lands right in here. Well, you can absolutely add them and uh, create some more variety in your piece, but you don't have to do that as well. That's part of the advantage of being the artist is that you get to control exactly what is in your world. The 
which is kind of a nice thing. <laughs> All right, so that is a little introduction to how you can draw landscapes on your own out in nature. Again, we have landscape drawing workshops where we sit for a full hour and a half and do a completed landscape drawing together. So if you're interested in that, I'll be sharing the workshop schedule with you at the conclusion of class, which is in about 14 minutes. So. As much as I'd like to continue drawing this landscape with you guys, it's time to move on. Also, uh, if you want, you could also add the date, the location, temperatures, all these data points that we did in our nest drawing can also be injected into your landscape, making it not only a wonderful um, visual representation, but also a data rich uh, representation of where you just were as well. So that's something to consider also for uh, future reference, okay? Put your little signature down here. There you go. Great. So I'm going to share my camera with you again. Okay. And we're going to do an exercise. I had mentioned it's going to be much more forgiving than this than this particular one, um, because you're supposed to uh, essentially. We're, we're pretending that we're on a hike together, right? And we're going to do some gesture drawing. Now, when you draw wildlife, birds, beasts alike, they rarely are still, okay? So if you look at the picture behind the text there, it looks like, you know, you have a nice drawing of a bird and then you have this crazy sketch of a bird that looks like it's taking off, but there's another thing on top of it. That's a gesture drawing, right? So. The idea is to capture the essence of movement, not to accurately portray a full-blown drawing of an animal, okay? Now, <clears throat> animals move in, in patterns. They cycle through a series of behaviors. So if I were to start a drawing and the animal moves, I'll stop that drawing and begin a new drawing, and then I'll continue doing that. And then when the animal completes its cycle, it's going to make the same exact movement as it did when I started my first drawing. So I can always go back to it, right? So a visual example of this, you know, here is a, an example of a gesture drawing of a bird that was hopping around. It took off. It's messy. It's fast. It fills up the whole page. That's kind of the idea. You want to just capture the gesture or the movement of an animal. And I'll give you an example. Um, so uh, I was watching a duck and this duck was preening itself, right? So for example, these really rough outlines of the duck are capturing its different movements. So if, it he if its head moves, right? So for example, if it's looking right at us, okay, here's the bird. Okay, oh, and now it just moved its head. What I'm gonna do is stop this drawing and I'm gonna start a new drawing and show where the bird moved its head, just like this. Okay, and as soon as it moves its head again, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna start a new drawing and maybe it looks this way this time. So it's kind of a game. Okay, and you're allowed to start and stop. You don't have to finish anything. It's like I said, very forgiving. And like I, when, it, when a bird begins moving through a cycle of moments, uh, movements, left to right, left to right, eventually they'll return to their original position and they might stay there long enough for you to continue drawing and so on and so forth. So again, it's, yeah, it's like action. It's like comics, okay? It's like something that you do um, very loosely without feeling like, oh, I'm gonna suck, it's not gonna look good. That's not what it's about. It's about making a gesture drawing. It's about following the movement of the animal. And um, for those who don't know, I, I, did, I went to art school and one of the things our professors would do would be like, okay, draw this with your left hand if you're right-handed, draw it with your right hand if you're left-handed. Or they'd make you take off your shoe and draw it with your foot. You know, they, they'd make you try it 
and remove the all of those um, inhibitions that we mentally put on ourselves, right? It's just about capturing the gesture or the essence of the animal. It's not about making a completed drawing. And doing gesture drawing is gonna make you a better artist for when you do things like this. All right, yeah, totally cruel. It was like military boot camp, but for artists. <laughs> so the idea now that we're gonna do is we're gonna take our piece of paper and I'm just gonna flip it over to the other side here. And I'm gonna give us about a minute or so to try getting used to this. And it's gonna be something new, especially if you've never taken a drawing class before. This is the kind of exercise that art students do. We usually use human models, right? Or, you know, uh, costumed or nude models. It's, the, it's, it's just the way the art world works. Instead of that, we're gonna use birds. And you could sit out in your backyard and watch birds and, and practice this all day with them. It's gonna be a little bit frustrating, but for example, I'm gonna switch hands. I'm not a righty, I'm a left. I'm not a lefty, I'm a righty. So I'm gonna do this left-handed just to kind of remove that inhibition from myself. I'm going to use my left hand. I know it's not gonna look great. I'm just focusing on the gesture, all right? So I'm gonna share my screen with you, okay? And we're gonna have a video play. So pencils at the ready, so to speak. And the idea is we're going to draw very fast and dirty, just like this, okay? And we're going to start a new drawing every time the animal moves. There's going to be a lot of movement. That's going to happen, okay? Don't get frustrated. It's gonna make it, it's gonna make it so much better if you just detach all your pride and all of your, <laughs> and, all of, and just all your frustration and just push that aside for now, okay? We're gonna capture the, the anghina, the gestures of this bird as it tries to balance on a rock unsuccessfully. So I thought that would, that would add a little bit of humor, okay? So I'm gonna push the, the go button on this. And again, be loose, have fun, just capture the essence of the gesture, okay? You don't have to finish your drawings. It could be a mess, it could take up a whole page, that's fine, okay? We're gonna begin in three, two, one. So right off the bat, I'm just gonna go ahead and get that nice S shape of its head, okay? And now that it's moving, okay, I'm gonna stop that shape and I'm gonna come back over here. Oh, now it's pointing, but now that's stopped. So I'm gonna get that S shape again. And now its wings are opening just like this. Now it's standing tall like a soldier looking in a different direction, okay? It's totally chaotic. Don't feel bad, that's the whole point. It's supposed to, it's supposed to unarm you. Oh, but look, now it's back in the other position that it was earlier. There we go. Now I'm gonna make that S shape crane again with the neck. Okay, oh, now it's looking in another direction. Nope, now it's looking in another direction. See how insane <laughs> this feels? That's normal. It's supposed to feel crazy. You wanna get as much, and if you just wanna focus on the body, the body's kind of staying still right now, that's something that you can do. And just like that, boom, it's gone. All right, so let's take a look at what teacher drew just now. Not, <laughs> not that impressive, right? Of course, that's not the point. We're not trying to make an impressive drawing here. What we're doing is we're going to follow a bird as much as we can. We're gonna look at this gesture. We're gonna try to capture it. And before you know it, the bird might fly away or something might happen where we gotta stop drawing. Here's where our field notes can come in handy. Okay, let's say that oh, we're frustrated, the bird flew away. Let's go ahead and say, we're gonna use text here and we're gonna say, um, I don't know how to spell anghina. I just, that just occurred to me, but let's try it. Anghina, I don't know. Balancing on rock for, I don't know, how long was that? 30 seconds, 45 seconds? <laughs> 45 seconds, um, it slipped and then flew away. Now this is way more interesting. If you wanna think about it like a nature journal entry, the text with all of these crazy lines is interesting because if someone's gonna read this, they're gonna get the text and then they're gonna mentally map what's happening here and they're gonna see the attempt to capture this and that movement makes itself apparent here, 
it's an un, it, it, you don't consider this not a failure or an unsuccessful drawing. It's a gesture and it's, it's got notes and that's all it needs to be. Okay, let's try this again with an easier bird. This is gonna be a sparrow, okay? And I'm just gonna go ahead and flip my paper again. So I use this full sheet and I'm gonna, <laughs> I know, I know I'm reading the messages right now. <laughs> it's okay, don't be frustrated. It's just went from nature drawing to nature drawing boot camp. It's okay. Um, okay, so uh, sometimes I feel like the picture tends to branch off. Okay, so there are going to be a lot of different shapes. There are going to be a lot of different um, curves and, and things like that. The important thing, again, isn't to get the perfect picture. It's just to capture the essence. It's to be present and mindful of what you're looking at, right? So here we have Mr. Anghina, okay? And now we have Miss Sparrow. Now this bird is gonna be zipping up and down this line here, okay? It's not about getting the bird perfect. It's not about drawing the feet perfect or getting the beak. It's just about following the movement. Think about it like an action animator or like a comic book artist. You just wanna get that information down, okay? So we're gonna start this. Uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna keep going lefty here. And this is, a, this is a quick video, you know, maybe 30 seconds. Just get down what you can, okay? And we're gonna start in three, two, one. Okay, here's the bird on the branch. Very quick, up, oh, just move, new drawing. Just moved again. Okay, there's the head. Okay, all these different directions, holy smokes. How do you even, how do you even contain this energy? <laughs> I'm paying attention to the body, I'm paying attention to the feet, the things that are consistent. And just like that, it's over. Okay, I encourage you to go outside and sit down with your sketchbook and try doing this. Let's do it again together. Let's keep, let's keep building on this. Uh, just so you can see really quick, this is where I'm at right now. I got some very vague uh, shapes here. I managed to get kind of a tail, kind of a foot, but again, it's just very rapid, rapid poses. So if, for example, you start getting a knack for this and you start letting go of all those inhibitions and you begin to just focus on the gestures, you're gonna be better at doing this in no time, okay? And you're gonna find that maybe out of 20 little sketches that you do, you'll find one gesture that you really like. That means you made it, right? That's something that you strive for, that's your goal. So again, I'm gonna share my camera with you. And, um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do this just one more time. And then we're gonna end our class, okay? Here we go. Start this off in three, two, one, again. Okay, notice how that tail feather kind of has a scissor-like look to it. Okay, the beak's open. It's probably food nearby. Okay, trying to capture one sparrow head. So sometimes it means I'm just sitting there waiting for the bird to move into the direction that I want. And just like that, it's done. So we're right up on the end of class here. I just want you to take a second and look at what we did over the course of this class. Um, we started off with a warm up. We did our nature object and we learned how to not only construct a drawing using our system, but we added uh, date, uh, location, other data points, measurements into our sketch to make it more information dense and interesting. Then what we did was we worked together on a landscape. We worked on different types of textures. We worked on different types of tree profiles, uh, mountains, a little bit of shading and a little bit on the grass. And then finally, we concluded with the craziness of our gesture drawing exercise. Again, it's meant to be messy. It's mess meant to be kind of crazy. You want to just focus on the um, following the movement of the animal and learning about that rather than making a complete sketch. Um, it kind of looks like some kind of modernist sculpture here. So uh, <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, I have some announcements to make really quick, um, but before I make those announcements, I know we're right on the dot, so I'm gonna make this brief. How do you keep going after this class? What, what are some ways you can continue to cultivate your practice? Honestly, making more time in nature a priority is a good way to, to start. You know, hiking and nature meditation or just time in your backyard is a great way to um, put yourself in a position to draw more often. Sketch things that you like. You know, if you're a flower person, start with flowers. If you like birds, if you enjoyed the craziness of our last exercise, draw birds. All of these are great things to put uh, in a nature journal. And that's something, it's totally for you. It's informal. There's no hardcore commitment to it. It's just a very lighthearted and consistent way to keep up with your drawing. Um, if you want to learn more about these things, I suggest that you read up on them and become kind of a subject matter expert on the things that you like. That way, you're not only getting the satisfaction of knowing those things, but you can also share those things with other people. And what a better way to share things with other people than on the internet. So we have an online community uh, called the, um, the Hike and Draw community up on Facebook. I invite each and every one of you to sign up and join. Um, this is totally free. It's a group of nature loving artists and we share our work together. We have a monthly social event where we just get together and draw online. You get discounts to other workshops. You find out about new workshops first. And there's also other downloadable resources, how to videos and more. So head over to facebook.com slash slash hike and draw to, to join. And um, that way you'll be able to uh, stay, stay with what we're doing and to participate. These are some books uh, that you can um, check out as well. These are all um, gonna be in the lesson packet that I emailed to you. This slideshow is the lesson packet. So I'll be sending that at the end of class. Um, these are additional online resources that you can use in developing your practice. You can have um, a look at some of this stuff here. And uh, we have uh, some announcements to conclude this class. This is the schedule that we have. We are going to be um, doing more workshops this month. We have a whole lot. If you can't make these workshops based on time zone difference, whatever, that's fine. We record them. So you can either purchase a ticket for a recording and you'll also get the lesson packet and the drawing resources, or you can go to hikeanddraw.nyc and join our membership platform. This is an archive of all of our recorded workshops. There's new workshops that get added to this on a, on a monthly and almost weekly basis. So you won't be stuck with just the same material. There's new material that comes every time we do a live workshop. Um, there's also downloadable and supplemental material that goes with these recordings. So um, check that out. Uh, there's also a 30 day, no questions asked money, ba money back guarantee. So if it's not for you, no harm, no foul, that's fine. Uh, I encourage you to check it out and see if that's something that you're interested in. So thank you all so, so much. I know we went a little bit over, but I was having so much fun with you. It's kind of, uh, kind of easy to lose track of time. If you enjoyed this workshop, I encourage you to sign up for our other workshops. And if you feel so inclined, I appreciate any tips you might want to send my way. You can uh, find me at Venmo at J-S-I-S-T-I-1. That's very appreciated. And uh, share this with a friend, um, spread the word, and make nature drawing part of your daily or weekly routine. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody.